Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Is that me clicking? Did I do something? Okay. I'm not moving. <laughs> the e-dub in me. I always break everything. Test one, two, three. Hey, that's better. So it was the RF device. The Russians are jamming us. That's not true. They can't jam anybody. They're not doing a very good job in Ukraine, at least according to the newspaper. So uh, actually, that, that's actually not a bad segue. Um, wars, rumors of wars. All kinds of crazy stuff going on in the world. Uh, think about the headlines that you've been reading over the last couple of days. Think about Texas. Think about the steps of the Supreme Court. Ukraine, Syria, Afghanistan, the Horn of Africa. What are the Chinese doing down in the South Pacific? Indonesia, right? I mean, it's just all over the place, all over the map. Sometimes it seems out of control. Out of control inflation. The stock market. Like, you know, it looked like the stock market was doing really good. And then I was reading Wall Street Journal on Friday. It was like the worst quarter in like a decade. The first quarter was the worst quarter in like a decade. We're supposed to be on a recovery, right? But everything's all topsy-turvy. It seems like it's out of control. But it's not. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's definitely not out of control. Uh, we're going to see who is seated and where he's seated and why it's not out of control. And you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, I thought we were doing Daniel 7. Isn't it like all prophecy and all this kind of stuff? Well, it is. And that's why I can tell you that everything is not out of control. But before we get to that, can I get a volunteer to open us with a word of prayer? Thank you. Thank you very much. So first, my mandatory plug. Uh, if you have Church Center, you should have gotten a message like 30 minutes ago, not even, that I dropped notes on the Church Center uh, resource page. So if you're a member of the Overland Hills Connections Group, you have a copy of the notes. Um, and if you didn't get it, see, us, see me afterwards, and I'll tell you how to hook it up and how to get Church Center, because the notes are out there. They're posted, I'm trying to be a good steward and not burn all kinds of paper that nobody's going to use. Um, so the notes are out there. Now, uh, now to set this up. So we're Daniel chapter 7. Um, if you guys remember from our study of Daniel over the last couple of weeks, uh, starting in Daniel 2, verse 4, the language switched to Aramaic. 
and Daniel, the book of Daniel tells us that, you know, so that people started speaking in Chaldean, so in Aramaic, um, or that Chaldeans started speaking in Aramaic. And chapter 7 is the end of the Aramaic section. Uh, so the last piece of Aramaic that we have in this uh, completes with the end of chapter 7, uh, 728. That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense because when you look at an outline of Daniel, most people would go, you know, chapters 1 through 6 and then 7 through the end. But this con contains chapter 7, so it's the first of the prophetic visions. And so it seems maybe a bit weird, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's on purpose. Maybe the Aramaic, some people surmise that the Aramaic is to speak to the whole world, that the message is for believers and non-believers, for the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, that the people of God as well as the world. Because, I mean, after all, Nebuchadnezzar had stuff revealed to him. God was speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and Daniel was interpreting for him, as well as the other kings that followed after him. Um, so we've got that going on. So we've got the whole Aramaic piece. Uh, also, if you're keeping score at home, uh, you'll notice that there's a, a chiasm, so it's kind of the the inverse or mirroring image. It's a, it's a literary device that's used between chapter 2 and chapter 7. And really, you, you can almost say that the whole book of Daniel is one big chiasm where it starts out and it's then the, the second half is a mirror image of it. But certainly, chapter 2 and chapter 7. Because remember, chapter 2 was these four kingdoms as depicted by the statue, you know, the golden head, the silver, and then... Uh, the bronze and then the iron. And a lot of us think, well, okay, it's the gold because Nebuchadnezzar stole. That's you. That's the Babylonian Empire. And then the silver is made with the Med Medo-Persian Empire, the bronze being the Greeks, and then iron being the Romans. Well, you see the same imagery with the four beasts that we're going to read about today coming out of the Great Sea. So there's this chiastic structure. Um, and so, so there's a certain symmetry to that. So we, we notice that. But the thing I want to put before you, and I want you to look for as you're reading this, is that chapter 7 is really the high point of Daniel. It's the center of gravity, if you will. Center of gravity is like the pivot point, um, the, the point at which everything rests. If you've ever built a deck, if you've ever worked with, with Bob and built a deck, it's that one pillar, that one piling, that if you pull that out, everything else falls apart, right? So I, could, I would submit to you that chapter 7 is the center of gravity for Daniel, the high point of Daniel, but it's probably a center of gravity for our understanding of history. If you understand, in general, the message of chapter 7, you hold in your hand the key to history. And this isn't some crazy numerology thing. I'm not going to tell you that, you know, there's 316 Hebrew letters in the Ten Commandments, and there's 316 commands, as the rabbis say, uh, in all of Scripture. No, it's not one of those. It's, it's a right understanding of history, and it has to do with who's on the throne and who is in control. Um, there's many interpretations of Daniel 7, uh, but there's one above all. The Most High God is the reigning king in heaven and earth course there's an opposition to his rule it's formidable in appearance and powerful but all the time the most high god is in control even when his opponents are most successful and we'll go back to that so therefore those who are allied with him will also triumph so we're going to open up in daniel 7 which some people call one of the summits of scripture so Read with me as I read uh, Daniel 7 to us. I was even telling somebody that I should have marked this better. All right, Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision... By night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and the four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. 
And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear, it was raised up on one side, it had three ribs in its mouth and its, between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, this horn were eyes like a man and a mouth speaking great things. And I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then, because of the sound of the great words, that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burnt with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, in which devoured and broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up before it in which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things. And that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, the horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms and it shall devour the whole earth, trample it down, break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise and another shall rise after them He shall be different from the former ones. He shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given to his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed in the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve him and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my collar changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. This is the word of God. And I understand, I think, at least to a small degree, why Daniel might be alarmed. I mean, this could be an alarming passage. You've got winds from heaven. You've got the great sea. You've got beasts that are terrifying. Daniel is distressed. You've got the Ancient of Days seated on a throne with thousands, thousands serving. You've got a little horn speaking great things. And when he says great things, we need to understand that as speaking blasphemy against the Most High God. Great things is sort of a euphemism there. There's nothing great about what the little horn is speaking. He's speaking out against the people of God. And we see that the beast is making war against the saints, and, they're, and he's, the little horn's prevailing until the Ancient of Days comes and sets it right. I mean, that could be terrifying. I mean, it's terrifying for us. 
We think about like the, uh, the cake guy in Washington and Seattle. We think about the, the visceral opposition to a, a Supreme Court ruling that handed back the authority to govern life and death to the states and how visceral the opposition is. We should be celebrating in the streets to be destroyed an instrument of death that stood in this country for decades and millions of babies who were destroyed because of this incorrect ruling from the Supreme Court finally set right. Yet, we're sort of, we have timidity about it. We have some trepidation. Everything seems out of sorts, out of control. And, and so it is here, right? Daniel paints this vision. And how, how do we understand this? How do we start reading this? Well, the first thing we have to understand the genre, right? This is apocalyptic literature. When, when it starts out, uh, we get a date, and then he had a dream, and I saw my vision, and he says, And behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea. So we're to understand this like a great Hollywood movie. You know, Hollywood doesn't have anything on the Bible. Hollywood ripped everything off. That was, anything is good out of Hollywood is because it stole it from the Bible. Like how to tell a good story, good storytelling, a story arc, that, that's all from Scripture. So nobody created that. God created that. That's, we just, we're just copying what he's already given us. So like a great Hollywood blockbuster, we got the little date, you know, how it goes, did it, did it, did it, and you get the little date typing at the bottom of the screen. So we figure out that this is Belshazzar's reign. Um, oh, that's the guy that handwriting on the wall, and he's about to get sm- smited. He's, gonna, he's the end of the Babylonian reign. Darius is going to come to power shortly. So it's right about this time. So think about Daniel's state of mind. Daniel's seen him come and go, right? He's seen the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he's, um, he's stuck with this guy, uh, Belshazzar, whose father is Nabonius, Nab- 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 Nabodinus, something like that. Um, and the guy is such like a loser, he won't even reign in Babylon. He's trying to change all the, the way the Babylon, Babylonians worship. He's trying to worship a different god, so he's not even worshiping the right false god. So he leaves his son in charge in Babylon as the regent. And his son is kind of a tool, right? We heard about that a couple, couple of weeks ago where he's going to use the sacred vessels and hand them to his wives and concubines. Well, that didn't work out so well for him. Well, Daniel knows all this. So think about this. Daniel's having this nightmare, right? This is like a nightmare vision. And he knows what the political landscape is. He knows that the Medo-Persian Empire is on the march. He knows that the guy he's serving is kind of a tool. Do you think he was kind of anxious about it? Maybe. I mean, he's human. I mean, I'm sure he still prayed three times a day like he's shown that he's going to do, right? But I would be a little anxious about it. It's no fun when you have a bad boss. It's no fun when the stock market's going crazy and you see your 401k going to zero, right? It's no fun when you think, Somebody's going to make me do something at work that I can't do, and I'm going to get fired. Many of us have had thought those thoughts about one thing or another recently. Am I going to have to go to some training? Am I going to have to sign some document? Am I going to affirm something? Put something on my signature block that I don't feel comfortable with? Daniel's living that world. So he gets this vision, and it's an apocalyptic vision. So apocalyptic. The big thing to remember about apocalyptic is if I say apocalyptic, that you should see an equal sign equals theology of hope. That's what apocalyptic is. Apocalyptic from Scripture is not the walking dead. It's not World War Z. It's not War of the Worlds. So I've, I've covered like the whole gamut. I've got the entire age range for everybody in here. So everybody knows every, at least one of the references you just made, right? Uh, it's not that. It's not the sci-fi end of the world. It's not Independence Day, right? Which is a pretty good movie, by the way. Uh, biblical apocalyptic is revelation of the ending of the present age. Revelation of the ending of the present age, or this present age. So this age is an age characterized by conflict, and it's going to be replaced with an age of peace. The apocalyptic shows us ahead of time the end of kingdoms of this world and their replacement by the kingdom of God and his Christ, that is, his anointed one. 
And this revelation is unfolded in complex and mysterious imagery and has the purpose of comforting and exhorting the faithful. It's supposed to be a comfort. It's supposed to be an encouragement. This is supposed to encourage us. We're not supposed to read this and like, okay, which beast is it? Which one of the ten horns? Is the EU, the ten nations of the EU, is that really the ten horns? I don't think so. And that's not the point. The point is hope. The point is who is on the throne? Who is in control? What's the contrast between the four beasts and the throne room of heaven? That's what we're supposed to see. And we're supposed to see it in these big images. So remember, the movie. Back to the movie. So I got the little teletype thing going and the date. It's kind of like, you know, uh, Top Gun, right? You get the Indian Ocean, blah, 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 or whatever. Whatever they say. They tell you where it's at and, and what's going on. You get the setting. And then you start seeing the imagery, right? It's like these big, brash images. You hear the sound. But there hasn't been any dialogue yet. Because what the... The movie maker's trying to do is trying to evoke in you emotion. It's trying to give you a feeling. Well, that's exactly what this is doing. You're going to see a series of images. And you're going to, and through these images, you get this communication of a general sense of what is going on. The point of the image is not to dial down and, and find out every little Easter egg. Because if you try to find every little Easter egg, there's a better than even chance that you'll be dead wrong. That's not the point. The point is, what is the very clear and understandable message from Daniel's vision? He saw it and wrote it down, and it's for us. It's to encourage us. So we see, first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he laid in his bed. And he wrote the dream down and told the sum of the matter. So again, Belshazzar's father was kind of a tool. Belshazzar was the regent in Babylon. His position was precarious, and Daniel would have known that. The fact that he says uh, visions of his head, dream and visions of his head, is a clue to us. This isn't a normal dream. And he writes it down. It's not normal. So this is something set apart and special. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Well, just an aside. So depending on what your background is and where you're coming from, uh, there is a lot of scholarship about Daniel being written later and that some of this stuff was after the fact, primarily because there's such clear uh, pointing to what happens in history. Like, no way could this have been written before the fact. It's the same argument pe people use against Isaiah. No way could Isaiah have been written so far ahead of all these events. Well, I believe, like many of you, I'm sure, that Isaiah was clearly written way before Cyrus the Great was even born, and he predicted it clearly. Same thing with Daniel. Daniel didn't even understand some of his own visions. God had to explain it to him. He sees his vision. I, I don't know what that means. And then somebody in his vision tells him what it is, right? This is not written later. This is not written after the fact. And that's how I'm approaching this. So just to be clear, I, I'm not tracking with the, the critical scholars. Um, I don't think they're very critical in their thinking. So, Saw in this vision, my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So, first image, night. So, night, terror. Night, dangerous. There's something going on. Something lurks. Something goes bump in the night. The four winds. Uh, the four points of the compass could be completeness. And we see that in Ezekiel and Zechariah and Revelation. Of heaven that is controlled by God. So, if you flip forward, or flip backwards, I guess. Flip backwards in Daniel. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehokakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So that's the fall of Jerusalem. But what's the key th phrase there? The Lord gave. The winds of heaven. So even this image of chaos and terror, what's stirring up the great sea? The winds of heaven. So already we get our first clue that it's not just completely uncontrolled chaos. It's not without purpose behind it. So the great sea, what's the, what's the idea behind the great sea? Well, to the Jews, the sea was terrifying. It was 
instability personified. There is nothing stable about seeing. Think about it. If you've ever seen the sea, if you've ever been out on a ship, everything's moving all the time. There's nothing stable about it. It's also a place that's far from God. Remember, Jonah wanted to get far away. He was out on the sea, right? He was trying to run from God. So he tried to get far away from God. So it's viewed as unstable and godless. So out of this great sea, four great beasts came up, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. Okay. So this one's not that hard. We've already read up to chapter 7, right? We've already got the interpretation of the golden, the statue with the golden head from uh, chapter 2. And there's things that are notable about it. So we've got the, the lion and the eagle. Daniel was used to serving with that. And the other thing about this I want to note, um, think about you're a Jewish person and you get exiled and you're in Babylon. And like Daniel and his friends, you've learned the word of God. And yet there's all these images, these carvings of animals and stuff like that. I mean, it's terrifying enough to see a lion in person, especially if like you were growing up in Jerusalem. Maybe you didn't see lions all the time or eagles and stuff like that. Now you're seeing all these images, but they weren't supposed to make graven images. They were living under the law of Moses. So this would have been an unusual thing for them. I mean, it's not as weird for us. I mean, we name, you know, our sports teams after animals, you know, you'd like any sane person is a Cardinals fan, right? St. Louis Cardinals baseball. Uh, or maybe the Rams, you know, the L.A. Rams, but maybe not. Or the Bulls, Chicago Bulls, right? So we think about these animals. That's not weird to us. But for the Jews, that have been really weird and off-putting. So he, Daniel knew he was servant in, under the reign of this guy, this kingdom that was all about personified by the lion and the eagle. At least they thought they were. As our many of the nations of the earth, you know, the Russian bear, the U.S. eagle, the Chinese dragon, right? We, we always think about these predatory animals when we think about the empires of the earth. So we can see Babylon, I think, pretty clearly in this vision, this beast. It's a lion that had eagle's wings. But think about it. You switch sort of the passive voice. And its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. So if I was an Air Force editor, I would say, no, that's horrible because that's passive voice. You can't do that. But it's supposed to be passive voice because we're communicating something. Something was done to the beast. The beast was not in control. Some other force was acting upon the beast. And when you see the mind of a man given to it, you're like, ah, oh, I know what that is. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Turn to uh, Daniel chapter 4. I'll read for you uh, verses 34 and following. At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lift up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. Oh, remember, he was like rooting around like, a, like an animal and everything. God made him kind of nuts. Uh, and I bless the Most High and praise and honor him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him what have you done at the same time my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom my majesty my splendor returned to me my counselors my lord sought me and was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me now i nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble so I think it's pretty clear that the first beast, the lion, the eagle's wings, it was plucked off and things were done to it. It was given the mind of a man. Is the Babylonian Empire. That's the first beast. And behold, the second beast, another, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. Okay, it gets a little dicier here. Probably Medo-Persian Empire. That's at least how I read it. Big key here. It's another beast. It's another succession in many empires. Still not in control. It was commanded to devour. After this, I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard with four wings of a bird on his back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So again, same theme. It's not acting on its own. Dominion was given to it. 
But we have the four heads, kind of like the four winds, four points of the compass, four heads, universality. Um, leopard with four wings. That's pretty fast. So you see this image of swiftness. Well, certainly it could be Alexander, right? You think about this. In the lifespan of Jesus, Alexander, not, not during Jesus' time, but like the, the same amount of time that Jesus ministered on earth, Alexander conquered most of the known world. Spam. Are the numbers that they're using, three ribs, four wings, things like that, are those, do they signify something that those are those particular numbers? So I think sometimes they do, like the four winds, the four points to the compass, um, the uh, four heads seen in every direction. Harder, at least for me, three ribs, I... I don't know. I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna punt and say I don't know. Um, I don't see anything that would. I don't see anything that would allow me to stand in front of you and say I think it's this. Let me say it that way. I, I don't have enough confidence on the three ribs or even the four wings to say I think it's this. I, I'm just gonna say I don't I don't know. Um, four winds. I, I think that's completeness. I think it's four points of the compass. You're covering everything, or even the four heads looking in every direction. Um, I'm sure there's guys who have devoted entire lifetimes to trying to figure out what the three w- ribs are. I, and, and again, remember how we're coming at this, right? Images, and what's the big picture here? So we have four beasts. First three so far, they haven't been able op- operating out of their own agency. They haven't been operating autonomously. Dominion were given to them, and so on. Sir? Mm-hmm. And then in two more years, he gets another vision. And a little more definition. And I think that's part of the picture. Right. Like you're saying here, this is like the beginning of a big overview. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But it causes us problems, right? Because if I see the, the leopard with four wings, well, and I say, and I you know, stand on, oh, I think it's Alexander. Well, wait a minute. You said it was Alexander. Why is the ram Alexander? Because the ram is really clearly Alexander. Wait a minute. And I don't have a whole problem, uh, problem with that. I mean, you can shift between images, right? I, well, you guys have listened to me long enough. I shift between analogies all the time. Um, so, if the leopard with the four wings is Alexander, then who's the fourth beast? Terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke into pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Um, I, I have always, and I haven't, you know, studying this hasn't changed. I, just up front, I think this is the Roman Empire. Um, it's been said that the Romans uh, make a desert and call it peace. That's how the Romans operate. And it, we, we can look back and say, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Ten horns. So back to the numbers. Uh, completeness. I mean, again, gallons of ink spilled on, well, what are the ten horns? Like, there was a time when uh, Britain was going to join the EU and people were seriously freaking out because that was going to be number ten. It's going to be completeness. Like, oh, th- is this it? Is this going to, is everything going to go bad? Who's the little horn now? Like, and you start looking at who all the world leaders are. Is it Putin? Is it Xi? Who, who, who is it? Is it President Biden? I, who, who is it? It's probably not any of those guys. I don't think any of them are the little horn. I don't think, I don't think we're, we're in the end times. Everything, all the stage is set for Jesus to come back. But I don't know that we've seen him yet. I really don't. I, you know, maybe we have. Um, so I considered the horns. And behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which of the three first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So unlike the beasts, which are like big empires, and the ten horns, at least how I read it, I'm supposed to see this general sense of completeness. And the ten horns, that imagery is also in Revelation too. You see a couple times in Revelation, you had the beast rising up, had ten horns and the diadems and everything else. Um, little horns, I, I think the little horns a little more specific. It's a person. I don't know who it is. And there's some key things about this person. They're arrogant, they're prideful, they're about self-glory. Um, and we see an echo of this in Revelation, Revelation 13, 5. And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. 
So there's this opposition to God's dominion. So we have the scene set, right? Chaos, beast rising out of the, of the great sea, instability personified. And as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. So if you're looking in your Bible, this section might be set off as poetry. Because I guess in the Aramaic, it is poetry. So there's a, there's a shift, right? So you have the chiastic structure, but not just that. I mean, we're getting hints from how this is put together. So I shift from just this narrative format to a poetic structure. So I shift from the images of the beasts to something that's more calm and orderly and serene. Because poetry, if anything, is orderly. You express order through your poetry, and it constrains your thoughts. Now I'm really geeking out like an English major, right? Um, so we're, what we see is this image of calm. Revelation 4, 6, And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. In Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, where the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. As for the Ancient of Days, and in some, maybe some of your translations, this one is not capitalized, but then the second time the Ancient of Days comes up, it is capitalized. That's a little nuance. In, in my translation, it's capitalized both times. Because it, I think the clear, it's clear that Ancient of Di- Days is not just some old dude sitting on a throne. But there is this idea that perhaps when Aunt Daniel first saw this, he's like, well, who's the old guy with the white hair and the like, shiny clothes? And then he gradually dawns on him, right? And if you're watching this movie, maybe at first you don't recognize that this is the God Most High, but it is. So the Ancient of Days, uh, Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And we have the clothing white as snow. And as Christians who have the New Testament, we understand when Jesus was transfigured, we see the clothing as white as snow, the hair, the hair like pure wool. And this image of the Ancient of Days, again, we're talking about imagery, like big IMAX, the roaring noise, the big image. And what's this dude doing? He's sitting. He's not in a panic. He's not confused. He's not confounded. Everything is in control. It's not even the image of Captain Kirk sitting on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise where he's getting rocked around and everything's shaking. It is serene. It is calm. The Ancient of Days is seated on the throne and nothing is passing by without his notice. And then we got the throne itself. It's fiery and it's got wheels. Uh, Ezekiel 1.16. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of bureau. And the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. And Daniel continues on and says, A stream of fire issued out and came from behind him. A thousand, thousand served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the court sat in judgment and the books were open. All right, these numbers, what are they supposed to mean? A thousand times a thousand, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. It's a lot of people. And that's the point. Multitudes upon multitudes are serving the Ancient of Days, the Most High God. And what's going to happen here? The court is seated and the books are opening. The fire imagery, fire, if you read fire in the Old Testament, it is always judgment. It's always about judgment. It's about cleansing judgment, the judgment from God. Psalm 50, uh, verses 3 through 4. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. So the judge is seated on the throne. There's a multitude ministering before him. The whole court is seated and the books are open. This should give you hope. This should make your faith rock solid. 
Think about this. There's multitudes in heaven and the books are being opened. And the persecution that you suffered is going to be judged. The wrong that you suffered will be judged. If you're burnt at the stake, that right will be put that wrong will be put right. God is in control. Everything that's going on, the scourge of disease, the the terror of injustice, the terror of war, all of that's going to be put right. God is in control. We're not alone. We're not acting in vain. When we keep the faith and we do what God commands us to do, it's not for no reason. That's because this is what we answer to. Our commander is in the throne room of heaven. That's who we serve. We're not tossed around in the great sea like these beasts. We're controlled by the Most High God. So St. Clair Ferguson told the story of a missionary who was returning to New York City, uh, sailing into the harbor. It was a time when you could only travel by ship. Um, and there was a diplomat, a U.S. diplomat coming back. So both boats pull up at the same time. And there's a crowd and band and everything to receive this diplomat back home from wherever he was. And the missionary is kind of feeling sorry for himself. I mean, a little bit of self-pity. I mean, think about it. You're out on the mission field. And it's in the age of sail and steam, going on the mission field is a big deal. There was like a better than even chance that you were not coming home. And if you like took somebody with you, an even better than even chance that they weren't coming back with you. Like if two of you left, probably only one of you is going to come back home. Right? This guy's thinking, you know, I'm, I'm giving my life to bring people to the Lord. And there's nobody to meet him. And then it dawned on him. What do you think dawned on him? He wasn't home. That wasn't his real homecoming. We're waiting for our real homecoming. And our real homecoming is going to look like the throne room that Daniel is describing in his visions. And it stands in direct opposition to the beast rising out of the great sea. The chaos and tumult mean nothing. And I'm going to prove it to you right here in verse 11. And I looked because of the sound of the great words of the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and his body destroyed and given over to be burnt with fire. Now that is anticlimactic in the extreme. I mean, like, come on, Lord of the Rings, the return of the king, you got the black gate, the mouth rides out, and Aragorn chops his head off, and then they're surrounded, and at the last moment, the tower collapses because Frodo sacrificed himself and everything else, right? Nope, nope, that wasn't it. Done, the beast is dead. God is in control. Again, that is a God we serve, and it is supposed to be anticlimactic. God doesn't win by one point. He wins a million to nothing, a quadrillion to nothing. Yes, ma'am. What I think is kind of interesting about that is you see these big descriptions of these beasts, you know, great glory, horns, all this. And it, like you said, it's just like that. God comes and all that scary stuff, nothing. Yep. It's nothing in comparison. Yeah. Does it, like, he doesn't lift a finger, no sweat, no nothing, no effort. He doesn't have to ride into it. It's just done. And as for the beasts, their dominion was taken away. But their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. Again, they are being acted upon. They are not autonomous. Daniel continues on and says, I saw in the night visions, behold, within the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So this is dripping with theological significance. Uh, first, if you read it quickly, it's like, oh, some, like a man came. No, like a son of man. And this is specific. It's not a general description. It's not like it's just some dude. It's not the four winds. It's not 10,000 times 10,000. It's like one like a son of man. Uh, Matthew 26, 64. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So Jesus seems to be tracking back to Daniel 7. 14 says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, 
And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So just as an aside, back up in Daniel chapter 3, verse 4. The herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, languages. I, I just, I can't help but miss the irony, you know, see the irony there, that uh, in 14, 714, uh, that all peoples, nations, and languages serve him. That is the Son of Man. So Nebuchadnezzar sent out a proclamation for everybody to, all the people of peoples, nations, and languages to bow down to the golden idol. But 714 sets it right. That dominion and glory and a kingdom for all peoples, nations, and languages to serve the Son of Man. That is Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God our Lord and Savior. Daniel continues on. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. You think? I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me, made known to me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are the four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Well, let's talk about that. How is that going to work? Like, I thought the Son of Man in the Ancient of Days was going to give it to him. Um, so what we've got, I'm going to read you out of Matthew. I've been reading a lot of Matthew today. Um, so Matthew 25. Uh, this is the final judgment as Jesus describes it. 25.31 When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you drink? And when do we see you as a stranger and welcome you, naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king shall answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least one of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And of course we see how those who did not are cast out. The judgment. Those who have Christ and those who do not. Um, so that... The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. There are those who are identified with Jesus. We see that sketched out in, in really great detail in Romans. That our identification with Jesus in his death and resurrection, or in his death, allows us to be identified with him in his resurrection. And we become heirs with him, heirs with Christ, heirs of a kingdom. And that's what this is talking about. So again, big imagery you got the instability of the great sea and the four great beasts coming up out of it and standing in opposition to the things of the God Most High. Yet God is unperturbed. He is on his throne. He is seated. And the Son of Man is presented to him. And we are tied, identified with the Son of Man. And we're going to have an inheritance. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's like tied into this apocalyptic vision. So Daniel said, I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, which devoured and broke into pieces the stamp of was left, and about the ten horns that were on his head, and the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth and spoke great things, that is blasphemous things, and seemed greater than its companions. And this is a key detail. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall rise after them. It shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down the three kings. So up to this point, it's not very specific. Then it becomes specific. He shall speak words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He shall think to change the times and the law. And he shall be given his hand for a time, times, and half a time. I think that what the little horn is, is the final evil. And there's three characteristics of the final evil. 
He speaks against God. He persecutes the saints. And he intends to change the times and the law, trying to make everything in his own image. But verse 26, again, hammers the point home. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed in the end. So we got this revelation imagery of the lake of fire, right? The beast and the false prophet are thrown in the lake of fire along with Satan later. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. You can't help but see the contrast. contrast. This is Belshazzar, right? Who's about to get killed. The Babylonian Empire is passing away, giving way before the Medo-Persian Empire. The Babylonian Empire, the thing, this empire that everybody was scared to death of, that was going to go on forever. Like the Third Reich that lasted, what, not even 20 years? Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. But the Lord remains. He sits on his throne. So Daniel says, here's the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me. My color changed and I kept the matter in my heart. Kind of like Mary storing things up in her heart, right? The burden of vision, Jeremiah 23, 9. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. So Daniel is like, (laughs) he's wrecked because of this. And and of course, Of course. I mean, you've just been given this vision. How do you understand? How do you wrap your brain around it? How do we wrap our brain around it? Well, step back and look at the big picture. This great sea, four great beasts. is really scary. But in all of it, there is control. Control the most high God. Every step of the way. And see the contrast between this chaotic opening scene and then the throne room that's handed back to us in poetry. It's orderly. It's calm. God is seated. And there's a peaceful transition. The Son of Man is presented before him and dominion is given to him. And the court is seated and the books are open and judgment happens and righteousness prevails. And that's the God that we serve. So everything is in motion. The coming of the Son of Man is the beginning of the end of the present. All the conditions at least in my mind, are set for Jesus to come back. That when Jesus was presented before the Ancient of Days, I think that's paralleling the birth, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. Now we're just waiting for the last bit of the end of the present so that all these kingdoms, these kingdoms of chaos and conflict, give away to the one kingdom of peace. The end of the present uh, and the end of the end. So what's the big takeaway? God wins. It's all you got to remember. If you remember nothing else from everything I said today, remember this. God wins. Daniel 7 puts the punctuation mark on that. So that was a lot. I've got one minute. Do I have any questions? Can I get a volunteer to pray? Oh, Sam. Yeah, just one thing from all this. I think we're, when we're studying these works of prophecy, our first impulse can be um, to read it that, and Daniel had these visions and got out his abacus and he figured out that the exact date of all these things was, you know, such and such. But, right. But he's troubled by these visions. He, at this point that he's writing, he doesn't have detailed clarity exact details of how this is going to be fleshed out in history. But yet, with this exact word you said, he understands that God is on his throne. And at at the end of, uh, with the understanding he has, that is the one thing he has clarity on, is that that God uh, has ordained these things and he will prevail. Right. So, so for, if you didn't hear what what Sam said, that boil it down, Daniel didn't get out his abacus and figure out exact details. He didn't have that. He had the big picture. God is in control. God wins. Other detail may get fleshed out later. And, and maybe it's just as we go through, say, oh yeah, you know, remember when Jesus told us to go get a donkey? It's like that again, right? Faith through faith. Anybody else? Any volunteer? Close this up.
Alex? Thank you, guys.
Now we're on. All right. Nothing like a rookie up here. Oh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Overland Hills Church. Pastor Josh is not feeling very well today, so I was asked to fill in. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> no, we, uh, we are very, uh, very happy to have you with us this morning. If you are visiting with us, a special welcome to you. You will notice in the bulletin that there's this great little connect card tear off. And so we'd encourage you, if you're relatively new with us, that you might tear that off. Fill the information out, slip it in the uh, offering plate. When it goes by, there is a box in the back, uh, or you can hand it to one of the ushers. We'd just like to get to know you a little bit better and be able to add you to our um, mailing list so we can kind of keep you informed with things that are going on. Do encourage you to take a look at the bulletin, the announcements that are in there. A couple things to uh, bring to your attention. Number one, there is no youth group meeting tonight, uh, despite what the bulletin says. No youth group tonight. Uh, the all-church prayer meeting normally is on the first Monday of the month, but since that's tomorrow night and it's 4th of July, we're not going to be meeting then, but we'll be, be meeting on the following Monday, so on the, the 11th, uh, or not the 11th, uh, date's wrong uh, here, but anyway, uh, next week uh, we'll come up and uh, next Monday night. And then for men, really want to encourage you, we've had a change in location for the Friday morning men's Bible study. So we're not meeting here at the church anymore, we're meeting over at Chick Chick-fil-A uh, at 6.45 still in the morning. So men, encourage you to come out for that Bible study and time of encouragement with one another. Let's take a minute now just to uh, kind of calm our hearts, uh, prepare ourselves for the rest of the morning worship, uh, and then we'll join together in music in just a minute.
Please stand if you're able. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Please pray with me. Lord, you are a great and mighty God. You are our hope and our salvation. It's because of your son's sacrifice that we are able to approach your throne. I praise you and your son. We thank you for the miracle of salvation and the privilege of being your servants. Lord, we ask that you would be with us today as we gather together in your name. Pour out your spirit and help us as we come before you to worship and honor you. And Lord, like always, we ask this in your son's name. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain, I know that you are good, and this is the day you've made. Whether in life or death, whether in joy or pain, I know the truth remains, that this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Now I can walk in faith, you will protect my way. Your every work is good, and this is the day you made. I am a child of yours, you are the one who saves. I am redeemed by love, and this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. As we lift his name, this is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice as we lift his name. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain, I know that you are good, and this is the day you Bye. 
Amen. Let's read this together. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. of the cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect Holy One crushed your Son who drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away my sin jesus thank you the father's wrath completely satisfied jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table jesus sacrifice I've been brought near your enemy you made your friend pouring out the riches of your glorious grace your mercy and your kindness know no thank you the father's wrath completely satisfied jesus thank you your blood has washed away my sin jesus thank you the father's wrath completely satisfied jesus thank you once your enemy now see
be seated. I invite you to join me in prayer. Our Father God in heaven, you are holy. You are enthroned upon the praises of your people. Generations before us have trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Father, before your holiness, before the eternal beauty of your character, we are small. We feel that sense of inadequacy and dirtiness, and we cry out with the prophet who saw that vision, woe, woe is me, I'm lost. Father, we are people of unclean lips. We dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips. We know that. And our words, we know, reflect our thoughts and our deeds. And so, Father, we come to you confessing, confessing as your people that we do not live up to what you have called us to be. We fall short. We are often self-sufficient, ignoring you. Father, often we lack gratitude for the good gifts that you've given to us. Oftentimes we look down our noses at others and we are self-righteous. And in a myriad of other ways, we give in to the cravings of flesh expressed in Greed and pride and lust. Loathsome things before you, God. In of ourselves, Father, we are indeed unclean. And all we can do, Father, is take comfort in your word that tells us that you will not always chide. You do not keep your anger forever. You do not deal with us. You have not dealt with us according to our sins. You have not repaid us according to our iniquities. Because as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your steadfast love towards those of us who fear you. And we know because of what Christ, your Son, accomplished at the cross, as far as the east is from the west, so far do you take your transgressions and remove them from us. And to us, Father, you have become one who shows profound compassion to his children. You know us, Father. You know that we are but dust. So we thank you for the pardon that we have in Jesus, your Son. The immensity of grace poured out at the cross. Father, we come to you with our needs. You know we are dust. You know we are weak. You know we lack what we need. And so we're asking, Father, that you would be gracious to us, that you would bless us, that you would make your face to shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, so that your saving power would be known among all nations. And Father, we ask for your grace and for your blessing on our lives that we may be obedient to you in all of the things that you call us to do. So we ask, Father, that you would be gracious to us and bless us as this church, that we would be effective in proclaiming your Son and Him only as crucified and raised for the forgiveness of sins and new life and eternal life in Him. Father, that you would grant us your grace so that we may uh, desire and indeed live lives that are that are holy and set apart. Father, that we would continually put to death the deeds of the flesh, that we would continually put to death the old man, and that we would long to reflect the very character of Jesus. Father, we ask for your grace and for your blessing on our loved ones 
And in this church family, Father, to those who suffer, and we know that you, you can do all things. You can, you can conquer every discomfort, every disease. Father, you own every molecule. You've designed all of the DNA. Nothing happens, Father, um, in our bodies outside of your control. We know that. And so we ask that you would be gracious to our loved ones. We pray for Trevor as he has to deal with more cancer. We pray for your continued grace towards Treasure and Jeff and Alyssa and Tom and Candy and Amber, Lennon, Rita, and others among us who, who suffer from long-term illnesses and, Father, who simply have to endure with a thorn in the flesh that you have allowed in their lives. We know that you can overcome those physical infirmities, those challenges, be they cancer, tumors, fatigue, pain, undiagnosed ailments, Father. You, we know. We ask that you would heal. We ask it as well that you would pour out all sufficient grace as your word promises. We ask in particular for Vanessa and Corey who are battling cancer right now. And we ask God that you would cause those treatments that they're undergoing to be effective and um, Lord that they would be cancer free. Father, we know that it isn't just medicine. While it is a gift of your goodness to the world to, to have these technologies and medicines, Lord, above and beyond that is your power. You give the knowledge to come up with these treatments. You give the wisdom to researchers and doctors. And so we ask, Father, that above and beyond all of these things, that you would intervene in the bodies of these, our loved ones. Father, we pray as well for those who are traveling this weekend and who will be traveling this summer. There's just lots of going on and visiting family and friends and going to different places. But Father, we, we just pray for their safety, the safety of your people. God, as well, we're, we're asking that you would be gracious and bless our missionaries, and in particular as we, we think about Miguel and Clara Castillo in the, in the Dominican Republic. And as they... Uh, work to train up pastors and church leaders. We pray that you would grant them much grace and success in, in the training sessions. And Lord, as they seek to minister as well to the children of the orphans in Haiti, pour out your grace upon them and give them the strength that they need. And, and Lord, Miguel needs strength. And as he is getting on in age, we pray that you would keep him strong. And, and if he is determined that he needs to pass the baton to someone else, I pray that even now uh, you are raising up someone who is capable and able and, and shares that vision for, for pastoral training and, and uh, orphan care on that big island, Haiti and the DR. Thank you. Thank you that you provide everything that they need, but Lord, they're asking that you would provide additionally the resources needed for churches to be built, for the food, for, for the gospel resources to be, to be made available, Lord, so that, uh, so that those that training and the necessities of life may be attended to while they give their focus to your word. And we know, Father, inasmuch as you call men to proclaim the gospel, that gospel message will have a profound effect on the lives that it touches by your spirit. So we pray that indeed that that would happen. Bless them in all of that. Father, we, we acknowledge your goodness to us. And we give thanks to you for your steadfast love endures forever. You alone are the one who does great wonders. Your steadfast love never ends. And Father, it is, it is fitting to, to recount your love to us, God, and, and to constantly have your praises on our lips. You have been good to us, Father. And we thank you for the abundance of blessings that you have poured out on us. And we pray, as we have received from your hand, Father, that we would acknowledge that, that it doesn't actually belong to us, the resources that we have. And even in this time where there's the additional pinch from inflation and rising gas prices and food prices, Lord, we know in this part of the world, even the poorest among us have so much more than so many in the world. We know that, Father. Remind us not to be complainers, but to be grateful for every material, temporal gift comes from your hand. And it's just a, a reflection of the fact that you have given us the greatest gift of all in your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is crucified for our sins and raised for our justification. 
Father, thank you. Thank you for the good gifts you've given. And as we have an opportunity now to return to you what you already own, the first fruits of what you've entrusted to us, we pray that you'll multiply them for your kingdom's purposes, not only in this community, but around the world where missionaries are supported. And as each one, Father, gives, I pray that it will be done so cheerfully as your word says, you love the cheerful giver. So may our returning to you what belongs to you um, evoke delight in you, Father, as we respond to your goodness to us with returning to you in joy. And all of these things, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hand. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb. See. Worthy. 
So uh, my order of service says, children's moment, does anybody know if there's church for kids today? There is no church for kids today. Josh is away, there is no children's moment. <laughs> All right, the kids will stay in this morning. Uh, we have uh, behind this room here, there's a family room. There's also a mother's nursing room that is to my left and then just to the right at the near the, the north entrance doors. So take advantage of those if, uh, if you'd like. Uh, and you're welcome to keep your children in here with you. Uh, I see some new faces this morning, and I've met some of you. Uh, some of you I have not, and I would, I would appreciate the privilege if you would allow me to just to say hello uh, following our worship time this morning. Can I get a favor from someone? I neglected to put a bottle of water here. It, if somebody could thank you, Aaron. I really think Aaron's got it. So, Oh, well, Sam has one. Thank you so much. I just, all that singing just got me parched. Thank you for that. Uh, so Irvin and Betty Holmes are here this morning. It's been two and a half years, COVID, so great to see you today. Just wonderful that you could be with us. What a glorious uh, just opportunity, and, uh, and uh, we're blessed. Uh, we have heard reports of your prayer for us, and I know you don't like to be highlighted, but we're so appreciative of your faithful prayers for the ministry of this church. All right, well, let's, uh, let's take our Bibles together. I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38, that's where we are in our Bibles this morning as we continue our journey through the book of Genesis. Now, I'm going to read the whole chapter, 30 verses. It will help you. Uh, it's, a, it's a good story. Um, I will say this, PG-13, so... It's the Bible, so I won't make apologies for that. Just be forewarned. Genesis chapter 38. Let's give our full attention to God's word being read. It happened at the time, at that time, that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her. She conceived and bore a son and called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son and she called his name Onan. Yet again, she bore a son and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chezib when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wi wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shares, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the tent at the entrance to Enayim, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. 
He turned to her at the roadside and says, Come, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it, he said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her, and he went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she rose and went away. And taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Then when Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adullamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was at Eniam at the roadside? And they said, no, cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men, also the men, of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out. She sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not know her again. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb, and when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother came out with a scarlet thread in his hand, and his name was called Zerah. This is God's word. I invite you to pray with me as we uh, look more closely at this passage. Let's, uh, let's ask for the Lord's help. This word, O oh God, is a light to our path, and a lamp to our feet. It is living, it is active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It is how we know the way of righteousness. It is how we know salvation. And so, Father, in this time of proclaiming your word, I pray that your spirit would inhabit this proclamation. Cause what comes to our ears and is planted on all of our hearts, Father, cause that to be more than the words of a mere man. And, Father, as the messenger of this, I ask for a special measure of grace that Jesus himself would be glorified and your people would be edified. So grant us this, Father, for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Well, I know that uh, many of you live in this city, this area, because the Air Force or, or one of the branches of the military brought you here. May not have been your choice. Having been stationed here, I know some of you chose to remain or, or return after uh, retirement or separation. Uh, of course, I live here because the church called me to come over 18 years ago. And before that, I could never have imagined living here. Moving was a really big deal to us. It changed the trajectory of my children's lives, I'm sure of that. And you know this, when, when people consider a move and there's employment opportunities that come into the thinking. There's the amenities. There's schools. And, and I hope, as, as you've thought about your own moves as families, and well, you're here. <laughs> so, um, but I think if, if you are called to move again, and I know that's uh, on the horizon for some of you very soon, I hope that a major consideration you're thinking about that is finding a church. Well, as I was thinking about the passage before us, it, it became apparent to me that we're being shown that it mattered 
to God where his people live. It matters to God where his people live. Now, in the previous chapter, we dealt with this uh, last week. Uh, Joseph had been uh, the second youngest brother of the, of the sons of Jacob, Israel. Joseph had been sold as a slave and he had ended up in Egypt. And we know from reading the end of the story that Israel and his family, Jacob and his family, will eventually join him there. But in this chapter, as we give our focus to chapter 38, we're, we're given a glimpse into uh, life in Canaan for the family of Israel. A and let's just say they don't look like a people who are set apart and striving with God. Rather, they look like people who are ignoring God. Now, that's going to change, and by God's providence, the Lord will ensure that it does. Now, there's a promise, a promise that had been given to Abraham. We talk about this almost every week when we're thinking about this part of Genesis. That Abraham, but for the most part, his descendants would ultimately possess the land of Canaan. So that's where they are. They're in the land of Canaan, but they don't possess it. It isn't theirs per se. They are strangers. They are sojourners in this land belonging to the Canaanites. It will be theirs one day, but not yet. It will be theirs when they are able to dispossess the Canaanites. And at this, at this point, they are in no position to do that. What they need is some formation time in Egypt. Now, as we look at this narrative and how it fits into the, the larger picture of God setting apart a people for his own possession, what I want us to do is, is see that God cares about where you live. And I want you to see what he is doing to give you an eternal home with him. That's what I want. That's my aim this morning. I want us to see that God cares about where you live. And I want you to see what he is doing to give you an eternal home with him. So I'm going to consider this, this chapter just under two headings. I couldn't find a third. I know that's my custom, but so we're going to go with two this morning, all right? And, and they are these, corruption and rescue. Corruption and rescue. Well, first, the corruption. When uh, politicians and judges, when they take bribes or pervert justice, when, when people who are entrusted with leadership responsibilities for the good of people use that to enrich themselves, we say they are corrupt. We use the term that way. But you know, corruption is also something that is, describes something that is contaminated. Uh, when some foreign substance or idea alters the intended beauty or usefulness of a thing. So, for example, if you have a picnic tomorrow, if you're eating outside and you leave the potato salad in the sun too long, don't eat it. Good advice, I think. Don't eat it. Why? It'll probably make you sick. Why? Because it gets in corrupted with, with bacteria, right? That, of course, this is why I've told you this before. This is why Kathy tells me that, that I shouldn't eat leftovers that have been left in the fridge too long. You know, there's, there's a point. Now, we don't always agree on that stale date. And I'm just saying, even though we disagree, I'm standing here before you. So, <laughs> just saying. I think my judgment has proved to be correct. But we, we get this, right? Things can be corrupted by bacteria and people can be corrupted by ideas and values. And I take it that's what happened with Jacob's family as we look at this text. We, we see that in the scripture that is before us. And I'll just kind of go over the, the, the sections that we've covered and give some descriptions just to remind you. Verses 1 through 5, Judah left his brothers at Hebron, and went to the lowlands. Really, it's a place that was north and to the west, to a place called Adullam. There he befriended an Adullamite, a, a, a resident of the lowlands. His name was Hira. He separated from his father. He had separated from his family. Family, And I would say this, just as a commentary, he had also separated himself from his father's values and the moral boundaries of God's promises. And there, while in this place, away from his brothers, there he saw a daughter of a Canaanite. The Canaanite's name is Shua. The daughter, we're not 
told the name, but he took her and married her. They have three sons. So we're, we're covering a, a swath of history here. They had three sons, Ur, Onan, Shelah, born in a, in a town nearby, Kezib, which is slightly south and west of Adullam. Doesn't matter. Verses 6 through 11, time is moving pretty quickly here. Judah then finds a wife for Ur. Her name's Tamar, and she's going to factor in this story. Now, she's likely a Canaanite. She's likely, or, or possibly a Philistine, not entirely sure. But we're told in verse 7 that Ur was wicked, so the Lord just put him to death. Now, we're not told what his wickedness was. We're not told what his sin was. But maybe he was just like the Canaanites. The Lord determined that he was not redeemable. And that leaves Tamar childless. Well, the next thing that happens, Judah tells his son, Onan, you perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Now, this would seem odd to us culturally, right? But it's a practice that was, uh, this practice was carried out in ancient cultures because inheritance and land mattered and this practice was later codified in the law given at Sinai. So I'm just, I'll take you to there. Deuteronomy 25. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Now, what this is called is the Leverite marriage law. Perhaps you've heard this. And a form of this is later exemplified in the Ruth Boaz story. Elimelech had died. Naomi's children had died. Her sons, Mahalon and Kilion. There, Boaz, who is the, the relative, not, not a brother-in-law, but a more distant relative, but certainly in the family tree, there he is called a kinsman redeemer, and he effectively brings offspring through his marriage to Ruth to the family, thus protecting the family. And incidentally, this law was the basis of uh, uh, an argument or a challenge that Sadducees had brought to Jesus. They were trying to trap him, and in his own application of biblical law, the Sadducees had proposed this sort of scenario where there were seven brothers and each of them died without, a, without a offspring. Thus, the woman had married successively seven times and there was no offspring. And the question the Sadducees asked was, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Of course, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They just simply wanted to trap Jesus. This is the basis for this. It's called the Leverite marriage law. Lever is simply L-E-V-I-R. It's an English way of uh, expressing a Latin word which simply means brother-in-law. So there you have that, that foundation. Now, verse 9. Onan seems to agree, or probably more accurately, it really doesn't have a choice in the matter. Verse 9 euphemistically says, whenever he went into his brother's wife, and that indicates that sexual union. And the action that he took or, in fact, did not take is not stated euphemistically, and all will be general. He would simply ensure that she did not conceive. Now, his motivation here was, was that the offspring would not be reckoned to him. That offspring would be reckoned to his dead brother. And he didn't, he didn't want to dilute his own opportunity for inheritance. So it was a sin against the Lord because it, what it did was mocked marriage and one of the proper purposes of the institution of marriage, offspring. He mocked it by his actions. And it revealed his own covetousness, right? If he could deny his brother offspring, more stuff for him. It was certainly dishonoring to his dead brother and it was, and it was dishonoring to Tamar. Her reasonable expectation was that she would conceive a child in marriage. And so this was wicked in the sight of the Lord. So like his brother, the Lord put him to death as well. Now we've got a situation here. Tamar is now twice widowed and she is still childless. And Judah tells her, well, go live as a widow in your father's house until such a time as his third son, Shelah, comes of age. But we see in the text, he has no intention 
because perhaps he's superstitious. Well, if I give Shayla, he's going to die too. This girl is trouble. But he gives her the impression that he's going to fulfill this responsibility. The day never comes. Verses 12 through 23. And we're moving through history pretty quickly. Judah's wife died. And it just tells us in the course of time, not really any time stamp on that. But it's really after a period of mourning after his wife died, he just simply goes to carry on business, which involved checking on his sheep shearers in a place called Timnah. Now Tamar, she was told about the journey somehow. And so she dresses herself in the manner of a prostitute and she positions herself where she knows he is on the road to Timnah at the, at the city gate of this town called An Anayim. Now in her mind, she's going, okay, Shayla's grown up. He's not my husband. I gotta do something, right? That's her reason. Now she's veiled here. Judah does not recognize her. So Judah propositions her. They agree on a young goat for, for her services. And he agreed to provide that later. And what she wants is a pledge. Well, what certainty do I have that you're going to bring me the young goat? He says, what do you want? And she asks, give me your signet, your cord, and your staff. And that signet was that unique identifier, really the means by which he would transact any sort of business. And we could equate it today with a, a personal ID, which if you're carrying it, that's you. Picture matches the ID. You can do business with that. So he gives that to her in a pledge. He needs this back. So it's a good, solid pledge. After this encounter, Tamar puts on her widow garments and returns home. Judah sends his friend Hiram to make good on the, on the pledge, but the woman's nowhere to be found. And the locals know of no such cult prostitute. So, just to summarize this, Ur, Onan, both wicked. The Lord puts them to death. Tamar's desire for offspring... Right? She comes up with this plan that involves incest. It's, it's like, who thinks of this stuff? Well, these people. This is a righteous desire, but executed in, in a most wicked way. Tamar dresses as a prostitute, and get this, believing she will have success in enticing Judah. Now, if you just pause there for a moment, it's not hard to imagine that it was known to Tamar that Judah frequented the cult prostitutes, or else why would she even think that she would have success in this? And, and really, as we think about Judah, what business did Judah, a son of the covenant, what did he have, what business did he have going to a prostitute? And indeed, even more so as we think about Canaanite culture, if he thought her to be a cult prostitute, he was not only involved in an immoral practice, but an idolatrous act of worship in the manner of the Canaanites who sought the favor of fertility gods through their own evil fleshly acts. Just for a little history in the Canaanites, I, I found um, some writings by an apologist named Clay Jones. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a visiting prophet Talbot Seminary in California. He says this, We should expect that if the Canaanites worshipped a god who rapes his sister and has ongoing sexual relationship with his daughter, and sexually humiliates his mother, that the Canaanites would ape their God's behavior. It looks like Judah and Tamar are behaving in a very Canaanite-ish way. Now, as we consider Judah, his association with Hiram and his family, it looks like they've adopted these Canaanite practices. And clearly, clearly there is a problem. The family of Israel has been corrupted corrupted now, we've seen this before haven't we perhaps you'll recall back in genesis 19 Ab abraham's nephew lot he pitched his tent close in close proximity to sodom his family was corrupted by that and if you remember that story the lord destroyed sodom and gomorrah and lot had to be rescued the lord had set him apart for salvation he wasn't burned up in the city but get this after Seeking offspring, both of his daughters resorted to an incestuous act with their father. And this will happen again. <laughs> this proximity to evil cultures, this proximity by the people of God, this connection that they have with those living around them, it will happen again during the 40-year period. Just one example. 
40-year period of wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites became morally lax. Just before they were about to take possession of Canaan, this happened. And this is in Numbers. While Israel, this is Numbers 25, 1 through 3, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to the Baal of Peor. More in that text in Numbers describes the immoral practices between the Israelite men and the Moabite women. So it matters where God's people live. It matters where you live. And it would certainly matter for the Israelites after they crossed in to, the, to possess the land of Canaan. Now, applying this. If you belong to the Lord, it matters where you live. Now, I don't mean so much in a physical sense, like on this street or that town, but what I mean is where you feel at home. We live in the world as believers in Jesus. We live in the world. And Jesus intends for us to be salt and light in this decaying and darkened world. We're to reflect that to the world around us. So the solution we're talking about here is not to flee to a compound and shut out the world, but if you keep close company with the people who deny Christ and if you do not have the protection and encouragement of a home base, that is a local church, then you're at risk. You're at risk. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthian believers. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. He's clearly stating that there's this connection. Bad company is going to do something. So where you live, I'm talking about, where you live is whose company you value the most, whose opinion matters the most to you, whose values you want to imitate. And that's reflected that's always reflected in our most important relationships, right? Whether that's marriage or business partnership or your closest friends. With, with professing Christians, I've seen this all the time, moral drift happens. It happens all the time. And it happens in very public and private ways. And perhaps you've, you've read the stories of, of high-profile Christian artists or, or even preachers who've become famous and the word they use, they are deconstructing, right? They deconstruct. In other words, they, they reevaluate the faith that they want, once had and they, they sort of say, well, that, that's not me anymore. They deconstruct. But I take it that it's primarily motivated because they love the affirmation of the culture. They love the applause and the praise of the people that matter the most to them. Rejecting what the Bible says, for example, what the Bible says about marriage, about sexuality, about human life, those are just the, like, the cultural hot points these days, right? And the culture, as these former deconstructing now Christians, as they adopt these new attitudes, there's the culture saying, yeah, you're now enlightened, you're with it took you so long but these people who deconstruct they don't long hold on to anything else that the bible teaches including the exclusivity of salvation by god's grace alone in christ alone through faith alone and i'm sure you know people and perhaps some in our own families people who used to profess to be believers but they've capitulated to the culture they have a worldly view of love for example and they equate love with acceptance and affirmation of someone's personal moral bodily autonomy and they misapply jesus teaching about judging others but these quasi religious arguments reveal simply simply they're that they're in rebellion against god the bible gives us very very clear warning do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, I'm not saying we should treat the world like enemies and get ready for a fight. But we have to think of the world in the right perspective. Have compassion. Be kind. Be respectful. Be ready with an answer for your own faith, as Peter says. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. So I'm not saying disengage, but know that you're not to be like them. You're not to adopt their practices. Find your anchor in the Word of God, not in what people think is popular. And this, brothers and sisters, will get increasingly more difficult. We know that. To stand in the truth of the Word of God, you will be called a bigot. You'll be called a homophobe. You'll be called misogynistic. You'll be called narrow, ignorant, a rube, whatever names. But the difference between the people of God and the people of the world is who their God is. And our God is the God revealed to us in the scriptures. And if he is God, then we submit to him in everything. Their God is themselves. And they just make it up. And they decide what they want to believe because they're in charge. So you can't have it both ways. If your primary allegiance is to God and to his word, it's going to put you at odds with the world. That's just how it works. Paul, quoting from both uh, prophets and the law, he exhorted the church at Corinth, and, and they, were, they were struggling with this, right? He says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? It's a rhetorical question. None. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them says the Lord. So, it matters who you date. It matters who you marry. It matters who you allow to have a say in your financial commitments. It matters where you live. That is to say, it matters where your heart is. To paraphrase Jesus, what you treasure the most is where your heart will be. So, if you are in Christ today, if that is you, understand who you are. Remember where you came from. Be clear on what is your purpose in the world and know how you should behave. Those four things, who you are, remember where you came from, what's your purpose, how to behave. This is summarized, 1 Peter 2, 9. Listen, who you are. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That is God's, here's the purpose, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Remember where you came from. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now how do you behave? Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, unbelievers, honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. And here's the thing. Not right now. On the day of visitation. At the end of time, if you've lived in a, an upright way in the world as a follower of Jesus, it'll be at the end of time that they'll look back on you and go, you were right. And they will admit that to their own horror. Corruption. We must avoid it. Well, the second word uh, heading I have here is rescue. Rescue. Now, someone who, who can't swim and who falls into the water knows that he needs someone to throw the life preserver. They get that. But, but like the proverbial frog in the kettle, there are ways that people can be in grave danger and yet be oblivious to the peril. Like the frog in the kettle, as the heat comes up, eventually it's just boiled and dies. But it doesn't know. 
Maybe you read or heard the, in the news that, that story of three American tourists. They died in the Bahamas. And the cause, we just recently found out, was asphyxiation from carbon monoxide. And we know this. We, we have the detectors in our houses, right? Put that thing right near the furnace or in the kitchen. They were enjoying this, this nice Caribbean vacation while there was this silent, odorless killer lurking in their hotel room. They went to sleep and never woke up. They were having fun. They were just doing their vacation, living their life, clueless to the danger. Now, as I've already made the case, and I think the scripture makes it clear, living in Canaan, the family of Israel needed to be rescued. They were living their lives unaware of the danger. It was a moral carbon monoxide, if you will. And clearly, by the example of Judah and his sons, they were in danger of abandoning the promises of God. They were in danger of just melding into Canaanite culture with its idolatrous and immoral practices. That was the danger. Now, as we look ahead, there's going to be a famine in the land, and that's, that's going to cause them physical danger. They will soon be rescued. They will be driven to Egypt. Joseph has been sold into Egypt. He's going to provide a place for them there. Joseph will pave the way for Jacob, Israel's entire family, to be saved. Like I said, we'll get to that story in weeks ahead. But I would just want you to consider, just touch on this, how life in Egypt taught them to live like people set apart. Joseph, again, I'm skipping to the head of the story, Joseph settled them in the land of Goshen. This was away from Egyptian culture. The Egyptians weren't any more moral or upright than the Canaanites. But they needed to be provided for in Egypt. Plenty of food because Joseph had arranged it and they were settled in the land of Goshen and they were put in Goshen because Egyptians found the fact that Israel, the Israel tribes, that they, because they were shepherds, that was loathsome. That was like, you know, we got to get near the shepherds. Put them out there. Pharaoh says, well, you can care for my sheep too, but just don't touch us. Don't come near us. We're clean people. So that was helpful. <laughs> that was useful. They learned to live set apart. They learned to depend on one another. They learned to be separate from Egyptian culture. But, but a physical and cultural rescue would not be enough. Embedded in the story of Judah's incestuous relationship with Tamar was the promise of eternal hope. It's embedded there. And that hope can only be seen in retrospect. We can look back and we can see it there. Let me show you where it is. Now, Judah never found the woman to pay for his services to the so-called cult prostitute. He never retrieved his signet quarter staff. And rather than investigate any further, jo Judah, he just chose to let the matter rest, fearing, get this, that the incident would bring him shame. <laughs> you think? Judah, you think it'll bring you shame? But in thinking about it more, it was shame for having lost his signet. Probably not shame for having used a prostitute. Anyway, three months later, it's reported to him that, that Tamar is pregnant. Verse 24, Judah concluded that the appropriate punishment for her immorality was death by burning. <laughs> and you can just see the irony of this, can't you? What a double standard. Three months ago, he cavorted with a woman he thought to be a cult prostitute. And he is morally outraged and burning? He should at the same time surrender his own body to the judgment pyre. Well, before she's brought in to face Judah's judgment, Tamar sends Judah his signet, cord, and staff, implicating him in her immorality. You think, what a reversal. Uh, Jim was, in, this morning in Sunday school, Jim Omhoff was talking about just the, the greatest dramas are, are written in the scripture and Hollywood just borrows them. Well, this is one of those moments like, whoa, didn't see that coming. Can't make this stuff up. Well, Judah declares, verse 26, that Tamar is more righteous. And he gets it now because he did not give her to Shelah in marriage. And of course, more righteous is a relative term. It's comparative. 
Judah himself was quite unrighteous, and certainly Tamar was no paragon of holiness. But Judah realized that he had put Tamar in a difficult position. And the act, it was immoral, but she fulfilled a righteous desire. Again, she fulfilled it in an unrighteous way. It was a, it was a moral mess. And, and how could this scenario be the cause for their rescue? It's true that Judah's line was saved physically through the sinful act on his part and on the part of Tamar. Now, got to be clear here, just because some good comes out of evil never justifies the evil, right? We, we get that. It's a under, right understanding of providence. This is how God enfolds human actions, both good and evil, into his grand plan. It never justifies the evil action. But God does something in it. He accomplishes a good. Just as an aside, just in these days when the abortion matter is so much front and center in the news, you know the reason for it? So many babies are conceived outside of the marriage covenant. So many babies are conceived when it seems just so very inconvenient. But we must say this. Sinful conception does not equal illegitimate life, right? A sinful conception does not equal an illegitimate life. All babies, however conceived, they are precious lives afforded all of the dignity of having been created in the image of God. I mean, that's why Christians should be pro-life. Anyway, that's just an aside. Beyond the immediate effect of, of Judah's family tree continuing through this pregnancy and birth, what, what we have to do is look beyond this to, to the greater story of God's saving purpose. There's a greater story. It was originally revealed in the curse that Adam and Eve witnessed or were present to. It was the promise of a seed, an offspring, who would right the wrongs brought about by man's rebellion. It's Genesis 3.15. That, that seed would one day bring a fatal blow to the head of the serpent. And so from Adam and Eve to Seth, down through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then all the way to King David, then beyond David to David's greater son, the divine king, the forever anointed one of God, Jesus. This path from Abraham to David would pass through Judah. Now, Tamar is about to give birth. And it was discovered that there were twins. And the younger one, by moments, Perez, even fought in the womb for this place of preeminence, really, I would say, foreshadowing his place in the royal line of Judah. Zerah, we're told in the text, put his hand out first, and the midwife tied this scarlet cord. So he was indicated as the firstborn, but Perez was fully delivered first. And the midwife then declared, what a breach you have made for yourself, which means he broke through and supplanted his brother. And so the royal significance of Judah would ultimately be revealed at the end of Genesis. We'll see this when we get to chapter 49. And that path would be through Perez. I'll read from Ruth, just giving the genealogy. Ruth 4, 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez, Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, who married Ruth. Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Now for no, no other reason than the unmerited grace of God, the line of Judah was preserved. God took what was what had been corrupted by, by moral compromise. He took what had been compromised. There was rebellion. There was sin. And through that, 
through that, amazingly, ushered in the very one who would be the reason for rescuing them in the first place. The seed of the woman promised in the garden through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Perez, David, Jesus. He is the very reason why going all the way back that Judah was rescued. In fact, the purpose for God setting any of these apart was ultimately to reveal the last Adam, the perfect son of David, the word of God who became flesh and who was and is God, the Christ Jesus, God's salvation. God has gone just look at the arc of Scripture. God has, God, God has gone to great lengths in human history to reveal His Son. And with each story in the Bible, we're given a, a greater and more glorious picture of the Son of God. And Israel and Judah would be saved, not primarily because of Joseph going to Egypt, but because God could and would forgive their sins, and the sins of all his own, including yours and mine. He's done that through the seed of Seth, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Perez, through David, to Jesus. He's done that through Jesus who died. And he died to forgive sexual immorality, incest, prostitution, coveting, selfishness, hatred, idolatry, and if we should at any moment think that we're better, self-righteousness. He died to forgive that as well. And I hope you see that that's good news for us. Even if your life decisions have been as tawdry as Judah's, there is forgiveness at the cross of Christ. There's forgiveness. This is a pretty ugly list of sins. So where you're sitting, where you're listening, watching, you might feel like there's too much, too much to forgive, too much evil, too much wickedness. There is not. There is not too much sin that the cross of Christ will not cover it. So confess it. Confess it to the Lord. Look to Jesus. In your mind's eye, picture him there on the cross. And there heaped upon his body is every vile thing that you've ever done, that you've ever thought, that you ever will do. He died. He took it into the grave. He took the eternal consequence away for that sin. He took it from you if you've trusted in him. So if you have not, if you have not received Christ's forgiveness, look to the cross and receive it today. And if you have, rejoice in this truth. If you're in Christ today, by faith, you have been rescued from your sin. You have been set apart. But this is not your own doing. It is all of God's grace to you. He was gracious to Israel. He was gracious to Judah. And he is gracious to you. God told Abraham that he would, his people would possess the land of Canaan. It would be theirs to dwell with God and be his people. It mattered to God where they lived but that would not be the final destination for the people of God. For all who have been set apart by God through faith in the Son of God, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, he, he said it himself, he is preparing a place for us, an eternal home in his Father's house. That's John 14. So it matters to God where you will live for, live for eternity, and it matters to God where you live now in preparation for that day. And so because, because you have been rescued, be separate, be holy, 
by God's grace and power, seek to be the kind of person who will dwell with the Lord Jesus forever. Let's pray. Father, we are, in so many ways, we are like Judah. We've heard your promises. We've embraced your promises. And we are easily distracted. And so we thank you for your word that that draws our minds back to your promises and the hope that you have for us in your Son. Teach us as your people to be, to live those lives as set-apart people, not melding with our present-day Canaanite culture, but indeed being set-apart, even while we interact, holding out for them in our own witness the hope of rescue from eternal consequences of having rebelled against you. So God, we pray, be gracious to us and bless us that your name may be known throughout the earth through us. We ask it for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing a song in closing. How can it be the one who died has borne our sins through sacrifice to conquer every sting of death? Sing, sing alleluia. For joy awakes as dawning light when Christ's disciples lift their eyes. Alive he stands, their friend and king. Christ, Christ, he is risen. Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. Oh, sing alleluia. Join the chorus, sing with the redeemed. Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. Where doubt and darkness once had been, they saw him and their hearts believed. But blessed are those who have not seen, yet sing alleluia. Once bound by fear, now bold in faith, they preached the truth and power of grace. And pouring out their lives, they gave life, life everlasting. Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, oh, sing alleluia. Join the chorus, sing with the redeemed, Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. The power that raised him from the grave now works in us to powerfully save. He frees our hearts to live his grace. Go tell of his goodness. Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. Oh, sing alleluia. Join the chorus, sing with the redeemed. Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. He is risen, he's alive, he's alive. is real.
Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. <laughs>